So let me uh, let me take this opportunity to welcome you to our today's uh, revision session. Uh, we are doing um, financial management, um, our, our past paper, um, a past paper for 2023, December, right? It should be December 2023. And uh, this paper, uh, we are just looking and uh, analyzing it to look at if I were part of that class, what could I have done? For example, if I was part of this class, what could I have done? Now, um, after this session, because I have already prepared the the solutions for for the old paper. Uh, after my presentation, I'll just be able to share you with you the solutions so that uh, you can be able to uh, to revise uh, some of the theories. I can be able to see uh, being questioned there. And uh, I know very well if today or tomorrow during the day or um, within next week, if we can do two to three past papers, uh, you're not supposed to be having any difficulties in handling the, the FM paper. It's not something that is hard. Uh, the questions that are going to be brought are already the ones that uh, we have done in our classes. So in this case, uh, I don't see anything regards to uh, of my students panicking or looking at, uh, um, looking at it in a different angle. But... Um, I would like to 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 check on the the first requirement of the question. You can be able to see it, it is coming from the capital budgeting, and uh, not uh, to waste a lot of time. Let me just start with question one B, where we are being asked about. We are being told, Mapema Limited is considering investing in one of the following two mutually exclusive projects. So the relevant cash flows of each of the projects is uh, shown in, uh, in the table below. So we are being given the annual cash flows for two projects, uh, including the initial outlay, which we are calling here initial investment. So the cash flows are, in, are running from year one to year six. And basically for the basics of the financial management, when I look on the cash flows given here, I can see that they are irregular because they are not similar. So we say, for example, if in the requirement an examiner is asking you for the payback period, then it means that we have to be accumulating our cash flows. So that is what we discussed about. Now, in that case, in that case, when you look on it, it means that uh, if you are going to be accumulating your cash inflows, um, we should be accumulating so that we can get our initial play. So in this case, it means that if you can be able to look on the additional information, an examiner is saying that the firm's cost of capital is 15% and the cash flows accrue at the end of the year. So the requirement of the question, we are being asked to compute the following uh, for each project. Number one is the discounted payback period, correct? Then number two, we are being told to come up with the modified payback, uh, the modified internal rate of return. Then number three, they are asking us about the profitability index, right? So in this case, it means how are we going to be getting the um how are we going to be getting our discounted payback period as our first requirement of the question? Just give him me one minute, please. So the first requirement of the question is asking us to compute the discounted payback period. And if we can be able to recall from our notes. Uh, can we be able to determine how we define our discounted payback period? So let me share my board here very quickly. Uh, let me share it. So um, we are discussing about... Uh, you can even see you are not able to, to see an area where I have already written our question. Okay. Uh, I'm making sure that uh, thank you so the first thing to go the first question here question number one B we are being asked about the computation, the computation of the discounted payback period right 
So when we were looking on the definition, what is a discounted payback, payback period? We say it's, it is a similar, it is similar to payback periods. It is similar to payback periods in all aspects. It is similar to payback period in all aspects, um, ex except that, except that, a similar, except that we use the discounted, we normally use the discounted, we normally use the discounted cash flows. In our case, we normally call them the present values, right? Which we accumulate, which we accumulate, which we accumulate, which we accumulate until, until their total value or their total is equal. Their total is equal to our initial play. The total should be equivalent to the, to the initial play. You can see there is someone who is getting in, but uh, with the video, I request you switch off your video, please. So that you don't disturb the the other students. So um, you can be able to see we have said when the examiner is asking you to compute the discounted payback period, it means that it is similar to the payback period in all aspects, except that we normally use the discounted cash flows, which we normally call them the pre the present values, which we accumulate until their total value uh, is equal to initial place. So when I look on the uh, project X. Let me look on the project X. Let me check on the cash flows given. Right. We are given some cash flows there. So when I look on the cash flows, let me just copy mine as you do yours. So the first year, the cash flow we were able to get, let me write the number of years there. Number one, two, three, four, five, and six. Then year one, we have that seven, five hundred. Year two, we have 16,500, which was a negative. 30,000, we have 22,500, right? 22,500, we have 9,000, and then we have 7,500. All right. Then let us calculate it by picking our distance factor. So because we have said the first thing we have to compute is your present values here. Right? So what is our discount factor? When you look on the question, our discount factor under the additional information number one is 15%. Then we are going to be getting your present value. You're going to be getting your present value there. So in this case, you just know these cash flows are irregular. So in this case, if they are irregular cash flows, it means we are going to be using the lump sum formula. We said it is one plus R we raise to a negative N in our case here. Or you can go and check from the table. So in this case, it means I just need to take 1 plus 0 0.1 plus 0 0.15. Then I raise for a negative 1. Because we are starting with year 1, getting a discount factor of 0 0.86, 8696. I know now there is no anyone who doesn't know how to get this. We go to the second year, right? The second year, we are talking about 1.15. We raise to a negative 2, getting 0 0.767561, it should be 1. We go to year 3, getting 0 0.65, 0 0.6575, year 4. We are getting 0 0.5718. Then we go to year 5, getting 0 0.494972. Then we go to the last year, which is year six, get is 0 0.43, 4323. I'm sorry for that delay. Uh, 0 0.4323. So once you get this one, you just need to multiply with your cash flows. So let me start with the first one. That 7500, I multiply with 0 0.8696, getting 35, 32, 610. The second one will be 16,500, and don't forget it's negative. 7,561, get in 12, 475.65. The third one will be 30,000, 
we multiply by 0 0.6575, you are getting 19,000, 19,725. Then the other one will be 22,500. We multiply it with the 0 0.5718, getting 12,865.50. This one is negative. Then the other one will be 9,000. We multiply it with 0 0.49. 72, right? Getting 4,474.80. Then the last one would be 7,500. We multiply by 0 0.4323. Getting that 242. That 242.25. 42, that 242.25. So can we be able to accumulate our present values? until the initial outlay, right? Until we achieve our initial outlay. So for example, when you look on the initial investment, which we did under our first project, which is project X, you have been told is around 57,750. So in this case, it means, it means we're going to be starting with the 32, 6, 10, right? That's 2610 plus this one, right? So that's 2610 plus minus 12475.65. We are getting 20, 2134.35. We add 19725, getting that 9859.35. Uh, point three five, correct. Then uh, we we also look at uh, the initial play. By the way, the initial play we have said is how much? The initial play we have said is fifty seven thousand. So if I add twelve thousand, if I add twelve thousand eight hundred and sixty five point five zero, how much am I getting? I'm getting fifty two thousand, fifty two thousand seven twenty four. 0.85. I'm here to hit uh, the requirement of the our initial outlay, which we have said is 57,750. Let me check on what if I add the cash, the present value of year five, 4474.80. We are getting 57,000, right? 57,199. 0.65. Badu J Timu kupata 57,750, which is the one that we're supposed to be getting here. So how much do we require here? Because what you are getting here, uh, let me minus 57, 57,750. It means from the last year, we don't require the present value of that 242.25, but you only require a cash flow, uh, a present value of 550.35, to attain to 57,750. So when you are calculating your discounted payback period, right, we are going to be saying, we have already taken the full of the present values for the five years. So we have already taken five years, right, plus we just require some few months to generate 550. So it will be 550.35. You divide it by the present value for the whole year, which is at 242, that 242.25. So how much are you getting here as your discounted payback period? It means we are taking, for example, 550.35, right? You divide by 3242.25, uh, getting 0 0.17. So the discounted payback period for Project X should be, it should be five years, 0.17, right? Should be uh, 5.17 years, 5.17 years. So uh, it means that uh, that is the only criteria the examiner was using uh, to confuse you, to confuse you in terms of uh, the process that you normally use when you are calculating your, uh, the, uh, the discounted payback periods. And when you are calculating your direct payback period. So if we were calculating the payback periods, we could just be able to check on the cash flows of ours, right? You look on the cash inflows, then you 
you accumulate them. But when you are looking at the discounted, it means you have to be calculating the present values and then you accumulate. And then you accumulate. I know that concept has already uh, think. It has already think from your ends. So it means that uh, if I'm going to be doing for project Y, the, what is going to be changing from the difference of what I have done, for example, it means that um, um, what is going to be changing in the cash flow, right? Then the others will be remaining the same. The others will be remaining the same. Let me just calculate the modified, uh, the modified internal rate of return, number two, before I finish up with project X, MIRR. And if we can be able to remind ourselves about the modified internal rate of return, we say it, it is similar to IRR. It is similar to internal rate of return. It is similar to internal rate of return, except that, except that, instead, right, except that instead of discounting the cash flows, instead of uh, discounting, the cash flows, instead of discounting the cash flows, we normally, uh, we, we, instead we discount them, we compound. We compound the cash flows. We normally compound them. So rather than discounting, we normally compound. What does this mean, right? So let me just look at uh, a space here so that I can be able to elaborate this. So when you're dealing with your MIRR, in simple way. I just want to look at it in a very simple way. This is your simple way. So um, uh, when you're looking at it, um, it means that if I take the number of years, I don't know whether it will be able to fit here, but let me try. Uh, it should be six years. We look on your cash flows, right? Your discount factor at the rate of 15%, we are using one plus R with raised to power N, then you get your you get your present values there. You get your future. It should be not the present, but it should be the future values. They are supposed to be your future values at the end there. So in this case, when you look on there, you have this similar question now. This is your question in an exam now. Let me twist my, my, my camera to that end. Okay, yes. So in this case, it means your cash flow here for year one is at 7,500. Uh, 16,500. I know very well that uh, you can be able to see this, this part. 30,000. 22,500. Uh, we have 9,000. And then we have 75. So you're going to be asking yourself very simple questions when we are doing the, the future value. If these are your current values, how many years do you have at 7,500? Let me talk about they were invested at the end of the financial year. Because you know very well, if you want to calculate your MIR, right? The formula that you are going to be using, you're going to be saying, can we be able to take the root of? We talk about the total value, the total future values. The total future value. We divide all of these with your initial outlay. And after you get all of these, you subtract one. I know very well that I was able to share the screenshot of this, but in, in the WhatsApp group. But the formulas which I have already used there, they are a bit difficult for you to understand. So let me just break it down for understanding. So in this case, when you're dealing with it, you have to be looking at, if we normally compound, it means your cash flows are your present value. What will be the future values? And remember, your projects only take six years, right? It takes only six years. So what am I supposed to do? I'm supposed to be asking myself that 7,500 is a car for account for how many? If you deposit it today, which is your year one, how many years? Because the maturity period will always be six years. So it means your money will be staying there for five years, for five years. So here we are going to be having a discount factor looking like this. We talk about... Uh, 1.15 because of the space. Let me just take it like that. We raise for five. Allow me to say the number. Uh, we raise for five. Where is five coming from? Because the maturity period is after six years, right? So how many years? To say it was invested at the end of the year. One, two, three, four, five. Right. So in this case, it will be 1.15. We raise for five. 
to this poor file. How much are you getting there, right? And the amount that you are getting, because I don't have space, I just put like my cash flows of that 7,500. Getting 75,000, 75,426 will allow me to round off. The second one will be 1.15, we raised power 4, right? You raised power 4. So let me 1.15, we raised power 4. Then you multiply it with 16,500. Getting 20,000, 859, that is a negative. Then this will be 1.15, we raise for negative three, uh, we raise to three. So 1.15, we raise to three. Then you multiply it with 30,000, getting 45,000, 626. Ah, yeah. The other one will be, uh, this one, year four now. It's a car for account for only two years. 1.15, we raise power two. Then we multiply it with 22,500. Getting 29,000. This is the power of compounding. 756. They can see a lot of people are being informed to invest with uh, with money markets that they don't want. Um, look on how your money, your money should be working for you. So this will be 1.15 raised for negative zero, and that one should be 7,500. How much is this? And I, whatever I'm doing, because I'm not going to be repeating the for project Y, what I have done with X is what you can just be able to do with Y. So that is how the simple the concept is. So do your summation here. So 75, 426, you add negative 28, 859, you add 45, uh, 626. You add 29, 756. Plus 10. Uh, we are talking about 10, 350. Uh, plus 7,500. We are getting 79,799. 79,799. 79,799. So when I, when I go back to my formula here, so it means we are going just to be taking how many years? We are talking about six years. So it will be six years. We take the root of, we are talking about the total future, which is 79, 799. We divide it by 57, 750, which is your initial play. Then after you get all of these, subtract one. Correct? You subtract one. Now, um, there is a way I showed you now you're supposed to be uh, calculating this. For example, if you take your 79,000, you divide it by, you divide it by 57,750. Right. You're getting 1.38. Then you say, if from your keyboard now, you say 6, right? Then shift and this button now. That is this button in your calculator. Shift in that button. You're going to be having something looking like this. 6. X and roots. Then you put your answer there inside. You are going to be getting around, um, we are talking about 1.055 minus 1. We should be having 0.055 or 5.5%. Right? 5.5%. That is how you are supposed to be getting your, um, uh, you're supposed to be getting your modified internal rate of return. Then the last thing which I could be able to see your examiner is asking you there, it's about the profitability index. Eh? And we said it is very important because they normally assist you when you are doing the payback periods and the aspects of uh, investments when you are ranking. So in this case, when you are calculating the profitability index, it means it normally compares, the, it, it is just a ratio that normally compares the present value of the cash inflows uh, with the initial place. So in our case here, when you look on the present value of the cash inflows, the present value of your cash inflows should be the total of this, right? So you ask yourself, what is your total here? The total which you are going to be getting should be the present value of the cash inflows, right? What is the total? At that point. So we just say that 2610 minus 12475.65 
plus 19, 725, right? Plus 12, 865, uh, 0.50, plus 44, 74.80, uh, plus 32,000, um, that's 2,000, uh, that's 3,242.25. The total here should be around 60,441.90. So in this case, you remember, when you are calculating your profit profitability index, we say it, you normally take the present value of the cash inflow, you divide it with your initial thing. So the present value of the cash inflow of project X will be around 6441.90. You divide it by 57,750. So how much is this? You divide by 57,750. We are getting around 1.05. 1.05. So when you're good not to be doing your revision, when you're doing your revision, you should just be repeating the all the concepts. You should be repeating the same concepts again. You see how much can you be able to get um, in all those relevant areas. In all those relevant areas you need. I know that one is okay. I know that one is already sorted. Unless there is a question there. Do we have any question? Do we have any questions there? Any question? So can we go to the other requirements of the question? We go to the other requirement of the question. Yes, we should be. So let us look on the, because I have said, just repeat the same concept using project Y. Project Y. I am not supposed to be repeating the same uh, sequence of the question. I know that that one is easy for you. So let us look on the, uh, the other thing here. Pro, uh, question 2B. Question 2B. Someone to read this question very quickly. Let me start with Daniel. Let me start with Daniel to read the question, please. Question two. Yes, question two B. Uh, Job Nyangaya plan to invest into security, security A and B. The returns on each security is dependent on the state of the economy as shown below. State of economy, boom, average, recession, probability, 0 0.4, 0 0.5, 0 0.1. Uh, rate of re return on security, A, 27%, 21%, 18%. Return on security, B, 36%, 33%, 31.5%. The standard deviation of security A and security B, the covariance between security A and security B, the correlation of coefficient between security A and security B. So when you look on the question, it's very similar to what we did in our class. And uh, when you look at it here, the examiner is asking you about a very simple concepts which we have discussed in class about the standard deviations of two securities. We said when you are dealing with these kind of questions, right? It is just like how you have put your money. There is a money you have because Nasimanga, you don't put your money, or you don't put all your um uh you don't put your eggs in one basket. So you have to buy diversify the risk. And that is where you see there are people who are investing with Stan Big Bank because already they have a pure uh, savings account. But uh, those savings accounts, they are going to be giving you um, a whooping interest of 14% per annum. But the interest, they are going to be calculated annually. That is the, the same concept. So now the money market fund is working. 
And there are those people who like to have, um, we normally talk about uh, um, security or we normally talk about, um, what do you normally discuss about? We discuss about the emergency funds. You put them in a bank so that in case you have any challenge, you can be able to, to check on it and so on and so forth. But uh, when you diversify as an investor, you diversify your, your money uh, in different areas. It means we are going to be looking at what is the return of the investment which you have done in different areas uh, of your analysis. So in this case, when you look on the questions, we are being given the there are two returns which you are going to be getting. And when you look on the, the aspect of, uh, um, uh, of the portfolio theories, uh, it normally talk about the combination of two or more assets. And that is why we see when you are calculating the questions that these questions are very common in exams. So when you are looking on the combination of two assets, it means we are going to be combining, for example, in our case here, we, uh, we are going to be combining asset A and asset B. So in when you have these problems now in an exam, right? And the examiner, for example, in the first requirement is asking you to compute the standard deviation, right? So when the examiner is asking you to compute the standard deviation of uh, both securities, because I think it should be for security A and security B, uh, it will be serving you well, because to calculate the standard deviation here, not as the formulas you have used in um, uh, the formulas we want to me the for statistics, but these are the formulas commonly used under the finance. So in this case, we are talking about the summation of a return minus expected return squared. We multiply by the probability. And we said in the absence of the probabilities, you're going to be using the sample sizes, right? So do we have the expected return of the both securities? And we say we don't have. So in this case, it means if we don't have, it means there is no any problem. So we get the expected return of A, for example. It means I'm going to be taking the returns of A. I multiply by the probabilities. In this case, 27 times 0 0.40 plus the other one should be 21 times 0 0.50 plus uh, the other one would be 18 times 0 0.10, right? Then we have the expected return of B. Right, well, the first one will be 36. We multiply it with the 0 0.40 plus the other one would be 33 percent. We multiply it with the 0 0.50. These are very simple things. Plus, the, the last one will be 31.5. We multiply it with 0 0.10. All right, so when I have these problems now in an exam, I just need to take my calculator very quickly. I'm not supposed to be wasting my 36 minutes here uh, doing this kind of a question uh, plus 18 times 0 0.10. Here we are getting 23.1%. Then the other one will be 36 times 0 0.40 plus 33 times 0 0.50 plus 31.5. We multiply it with 0 0.10. What we are getting here should be 34.05%. That 4.05%. Let us get back here. The computation of the standard deviations, because when you look on the question, the examiner is asking you to calculate the standard deviation. Let me just check from my end. The standard deviation of security X and Y, uh, sorry, A and B. So when you look on the standard deviation of A, it will be, right, it will be, let me start by computing the variance. Right, the variance of this security, the standard deviation, I will be able to get it later. So this is our expected return as our formula. And for example, the, the returns, you can be able to see them from your uh, from the computation. So the first one would be 27 minus 23.1 squared. We multiply by the probability of 0 0.40. The other one would be 21 minus 23.1 squared. We multiply by 0 0.50. Then the last one would be 18 minus 23.1 squared, we multiply by 0 0.1, very simple. So when you take your calculator here, you just need to say 27 minus 23.1 squared, we multiply by 0 0.40, getting 6.084, the other one would be 21 minus 23.1, right, squared, we multiply by 0 0.50, 
we are getting 2.205. Then the last one will be 18, right? 18 minus 23.1 squared. Then you multiply by 0 0.10, getting 2.601. So what is the total here? The total will be 6.084 plus my answer plus 2.205 getting 10.89. So to get the standard deviation of A, it means I have to be taking the root of 10.89. How much it is? So the root of my answer, getting 3.3. That is the standard deviation of security A. When you look on the standard deviation of B now, let me just do it here. So for B will be, when I look on the first return, it will be 36 minus that 4.05. Right, squared times 0 0.50. Right, it should be four, sorry. Then the other one would be 33 minus 34.05 squared. I multiply by 0 0.50. Then the last one would be 31.5 minus 34.05 squared. Multiply by 0 0.10. So, how much is this? That six minus 34.05. Squared, we multiply by 0 0.40, getting 1.521. The other one would be 33 minus 34.05 squared. Then we multiply by 0 0.50, getting 0 0.551. The last one would be 31.5 minus 34.05 squared. Then you multiply it with the 0 0.10 getting 0 0.650. So what is the total here? What is the total now? So the total will be 1.521 plus 0 0.551 plus 0 0.650. We are getting it at 2.722. So what is the standard deviation in this case? It will be the root of, right? We are talking about uh, 2.722. So I just wrote my answer. Now I'm getting 1.65. That is the standard deviation. Now, the last requirement of the question I can see, the examiner is asking you about the correlation coefficient between security A and B, right? We say to get the covariance of A and B, we normally take the correlation coefficient of A and B we multiply by the standard deviation of A, we multiply by the standard deviation of B, right? But now, this is what the examiner is asking. So we don't have the, we, we don't have the covariance, but you can be able to compute our covariances. We say, to get the covariance of two securities, you can be able to take a return minus the expected return. Let me talk about A, then we have a return of B, minus the expected return of B, Right, then you multiply by our probability. So in this case, it means if I look on the combination of the two without the, the, the roots, the first one would be 27 minus 23.1. Then the return of B will be 36 minus 34.05. Then you multiply by the probability of 0 0.40. The second one will be how much? 21 minus 23.1. Then the other one will be 33 minus 34.05. We multiply by 0 0.50. Then the last one will be uh, 18 minus 23.1. Right? The other one is 31.5 minus 34.05. We multiply by 0 0.10. Correct. Now, 27 minus 23.1 uh, is 3.9. And like writing there, that six minus thirty four point zero five. Then I multiply my answer with three point nine. I multiply it with zero point four zero. We are getting three point zero four. Allow me to use two decimal places. The second one will be twenty one minus twenty three point one. Um, getting negative two point one. Then the other one will be thirty three minus thirty four point zero five. Then I multiply it with negative 2.1. Then I multiply by 0 
getting 1.1.10. 1 the last one now, 18 minus 23.1, getting negative 5.1. Then the other one will be that 1.5 minus that 4.05, right? I multiply it with negative 5.1, right? Times 0 0.1, getting 1.30, right? So 1.30 plus 1.10 plus 3.04. It is 5.44. We shall put a 5.44. It doesn't mean that the questions of yours is often is over not. So in this case, it means to get the correlation coefficient of two security. It means you need to take the covariance of A and B, you divide by the standard deviation of A, you multiply by the standard deviation of B. So the covariance of A and B is 5.44. You divide it by the standard deviation of A. The standard deviation of A, we've got how much? 3.3. Uh, we multiply by 1.65. So how much is your answer? 5.44, right? Uh, let me start with the multiplication. We are talking about 3.3. Multiply by 1.65. Then we talk about 5.44 divided by your answer. Getting something closer to this. 0 0.9999, right? That is the answer for that question. And you can see, by doing all this, we were supposed to be getting eight marks. Eight marks can take you to places we have never seen before. That is advanced level, right? That is how the question was supposed to be sorted. That is how you are supposed to sort the questions of yours if the exam is going to be coming in. But expect um, similar areas, these similar area to be tested, right? Expect, so we might be getting a question from this area. Let us proceed with our first paper, right? We have question number 2C. Someone read for us, please. Someone to read the question. I think I have already shared, yes. Now, who is this someone? Juma? Hey, Juma is around. Okay, let's read. Tabaka Fabricators Enterprise purchased one of its raw material branded Z externally. The annual demand for material Z is 400,000 units. The company is planning to change its purchasing system to adjust in time system to improve efficiency. The following information is provided. Purchased cost per unit at 25 in the current system proposed 25. Ordering cost per unit ordering cost per unit per cost per order 10,000 in the current 2,500 and uh, proposed just in time. Inventory holding cost at 20% and 20% in the proposed additional information. One, to implement the new system, a one-time cost of 140,000 shillings will be incurred. Two, the new system is expected to have a lifespan of eight years. Three, the required rate of return for the firm is 18%. Four, the corporate tax rate is 30% required. Advise the management of tobacco fabricators enterprise on whether to implement the proposed system. Thank you so much. Um, you can see an examiner there asking a very simple question to advise. So your work there is just to advise. Um, if a question is coming like this, I know there is a bit of challenge uh, from the students where they are asking, where should I start this kind of a question? Because already we have been given the current system, right? the current system and the, the proposed system of the GIT, right? But uh, when you look on the both uh, systems, the most important aspect that we're supposed to be taking here is, uh, for example, we need to be calculating the, the total cost of uh, the total cost of both uh, systems, right? Then from these, we, the total cost, we are going to be getting our net cut loss. Uh, from the net cut flows, um, I think um, 
we are going to be calculating the present values. And then from the present values, we'll be able to see whether uh, we can advise the organization to implement. Because in note number one, we are being told they if to implement the new system, a one-time cost of 140,000 will be incurred. And we're being told the new system is expected to have a lifespan of eight years, right? Then we are being told the required rate of return of the, for the farm is 18. Then they, we have already given the corporate tax rate there. So in this case, allow me first to calculate the total cost using the inventory formulas. I remember that uh, some of us who are, who are doing management accounting, you can be able or you have come across the inventory management, even you for the financial, for the working capital management. So when you look at these questions, we have to be asking ourselves, what is the formula for the computation of the EOQ? We normally talk about 2DCO, we divide by HC. You can start the question by, by doing your analysis. We start with the annual demand. What is your annual demand? The annual demand is per the questions, uh, as per the question, sorry, I can be able to see our annual demand is around the uh, one on demand, let me just check on my question. The annual demand we are being given how much? Uh, we are being told it is, uh, oh, up there. We are being told the annual demand for the materials then is 400 units, 400,000 units. All right. Then we have the ordering costs. The ordering cost, I'm starting with the current system. So, the ordering system of ours is how much? Imagine when you are doing all this, you are getting some marks there. The ordering cost here is 10,000. Right. Then we have the holding cost. I remember, if you, if you followed well with the working capital management, we say the examiner can be able to give you uh, the holding cost and call it the carrying cost. The carrying cost. Then, also the examiner can be able to give you a, a proportion of the purchase price. Right, the proportion of the purchase price. So in this case, it means our holding cost will be, when I look at it there, our holding cost will be, I can see it somewhere, we have been told it, the inventory holding cost is 20%. It should be 20% of the purchase, which is 25. Uh, this is 50, 50 divided by 100, uh, 500, is it five? It should be around five. Let me take my calculator and it's Kudanganye. So 0 .0, 0 0.2 times 25, you should be getting five. Correct. So what is your EOQ? We say my EOQ will be two times 400,000 times, right? 400,000 times 10,000. You divide it by five. So how much am I getting here? Yeah. Two times 400,000 times 10,000 divide by five. Divide by my answer, you are getting something closer to 40,000 units. And if, for example, you are going to be leading certain organizations in the future, it means when you are when you're going to be looking for the solutions uh, for the inventory management, one you have to be checking on the is the uh, uh, economic quantity. This is normally called the reorder quantity. So, how much are we supposed to be placing the reorder quantity in terms of? Uh, when your goods are reaching a certain point, there must be a reorder. When you are placing the order with the suppliers, how much should be the unit? That is one of the controls uh, to avoid the, they normally call the cost reduct, uh, reduction mechanisms. Now, that is one. Eh? So when you want to calculate the total cost, it means the computation of the total cost will be based on the, the total cost is very simple for us. Since you are going to be taking the total cost here, we normally talk about HC times Q over 2 uh, plus CO times D over Q plus P times D, right? I know that uh, this is the only cost per unit, which you have already gotten is 5. Our Q is the EOQ, which is 40,000. You divide it by 2 plus the ordering cost. Uh, in our case, it's 10,000. We multiply by the annual demand of 400,000. We divide it by our quantity which is economic order quantity, plus P, the purchase price, which you have already been given as a, it should be 25, if I'm not wrong, times 400,000, which is our annual demand. So how much is this? How much is this? So this one will be 20, 
Uh, if you break it down, this is 100,000 plus, you can see here, this is around 10. 10, this is 100,000. And we, we normally say at E or Q, the holding and the ordering cost are always equal. So plus 25 times, 25 times 400,000, getting 10 million. So 10 million plus, uh, it should be 10, 10 million, 200,000. Then from there, we come to the proposed. Proposed policy. You do the E of Q again, right? Two DCO, we divide by HC. In this case, when you look on the uh, two, the annual demand of the proposed is how much? Uh, when you look, I look at, at it here, the annual demand still remains at 400,000. We multiply it with the, the ordering cost, which we are being given as a 2,500, right? Then you divide it by five. So how much is this? How much is this? So in this case, it will be two times 400,000 times 2,500 divided by five getting the around 20,000 units. So let us calculate the total cost in this case. The holding cost is five. We multiply by the quantity, 20,000, divided by two plus, right? What is the, the, we, the, whole, the ordering cost, right? 25, uh, 2,500 times annual demand of 400,000. You divide it by uh, 20,000. You multiply it with the purchase price. How much is the proposed purchase price? So the purchase price will be, uh, we have been told it's 25 still. 25, I don't know whether you'll be able to see, 400K, 400K there. So how much would be this one? So the first one I can see it is around uh, 50,000. Plus, uh, this one is two, this two is 20. So 20 there should be giving us 50,000 plus 1 million, 10 million. So this one is giving us 10 million, 100,000, 10 million, 100,000, right? Uh, when you look at it, uh, we can be able to say, uh, to compute the net cash flows, right? To compute your NPV now. Net cash flow, sorry. The net cash flows of ours, we are going to be getting them by taking the total cost, the total current cost, minus the total proposed. Right? So in this case, it means the first one you are able to get at 10, 200,000 minus 10, 100,000. This translates to Kenya shillings, 100,000, right? Then if you take this amount of years now, this amount of years you are seeing there, uh, to compute your present value. So if I want to take it uh, for the next eight years, uh, I think the net the, the, the cash flows of ours will be remaining as 100,000. So it will be, uh, let me talk about the cash flows. Let me talk about the number of years here. We have already We have 100,000. We have some discount factors here. We are discounting at 8%, if I'm not wrong, to get your present value, right? To get your present value. So this is annuity. It's annuity. And the formula, if I can remind you, we used to talk about 1 plus R, we raise power negative n divided by, we divide it by r, like that. So in this case, in this case, it means if you take 1 plus 0 0.08, correct, you raise it to power negative 8. 1 minus answer, then you divide by 0 
You're supposed to be getting something closer to 5.74, 5.7466. So if you multiply by 100,000, you should be getting 574. 574.574664. That is your present value. In other terms, if for example we examiner wanted us to to compute the the uh the examiner wanted you to compute uh something called the um, what is it called? What is it called? We talk about um, uh, let, me, let me let me go to the question. I might be doing something which is not required. Let me just see. So the question is asking me that uh, the new system is expected to have a lifespan of eight years. So the required rate of return for the farm is 18%. So in this case, it, is, it means that uh, uh, we are supposed to be taking our future value, to get, the future value, sorry, to get our present values. So in this case, it should be, let me see, sorry, 1.18 we raised for a negative eight. Uh, correct. So in this case, this is not required. This is not required. That one was not necessary. So in this case, to get to your present value, it, it, it is, it, we are going to be taking a hundred thousand. We multiply it with, uh, we multiply it with a one, 1.18 we raise for negative eight we raise for negative eight we are using the concept of uh lump sum that is the amount that uh, because once we change it means the system is not going to be used so how much is this so 1.18 we raise for negative eight then you multiply with 100,000 getting 26,604 Getting 26,604. So once you get 26,604, what would be the next um what would be the next um uh, cost of the action? It means the next cost of the action, remember the present value of the of the new changes will be 26,000. So to compute your NPV now, so that we can be able to advise, we normally take the present value of the cash inflow minus the initial fee. So in this case, it means we take 26,604 minus our initial pay for the new proposed system. The new proposed system is 140,000. The new system is 140. So even if when you look at it on the um on the look of things now, it means that if your NPV is negative, how are you going to be advising? You're going to be telling the examiner that uh, they do not need to implement the proposed system since it has a negative NPV, it has a negative NPV. There is someone who wants to tell me something. Are we okay with that point? Are we together? You can just be able to type on the chat box, please. There's no... If we are still together, are we together at that point? We together. Juma is okay. What about the rest? Hmm. Okay, Mary is okay. Okay. So let us proceed. There is a question number three. Someone should be reading for us. It's a very simple area here. Question number three B. Someone read, please. Question three B. Question three B. Judy. Judy, you can read for us. Hmm. 
Judy is there? Yes, I'm here, teacher. Can you kindly display the question? The question. Oh, okay, okay. Question 3B. Continue. Question 3B. Yes. EFG Limited issued 300,000, 15% preference shares of shillings 100 each. Redeemable had 10% premium after 20 years. Flotation cost amounted to shillings 3 million. Required. Determine the cost of preference share capital where the shares are issued at one per two, a premium of 10%, three, a discount of 10%. So when you look at that question, it's very simple. Thank you, Judy. Uh, this question is not as tough as we can be able to see it because the requirement of view, it is the basics of, uh, we talk about uh, uh, the basics of, uh, the valuation models and in this case it means when the examiner is asking me uh, to calculate the present value or what does the question mean it, it means if they determine the pre uh, the, pre the preference share capital where the shared uh, the shares are being issued at par it means so the the the, the cost of our preference of uh, the kp in this case it means the kp now the examiner wants you to get that one. So in this case, it means we are going to be taking the preference dividends, right? Uh, we multiply by the present value of the factor annuity, right? The present value of, the, of all that. Uh, we talk about, uh, uh, we are discounting using what? Determine the cost of the preference uh, share capital where the shares are issued at par. Um, one minute, something that I'm not uh, getting clear there, but small, small thing there is I'm forgetting. That basics, but it is very simple now. Don't want to remember much. Now, um, it means that um, uh, we are going to be determining the cost of the preference share capital where the shares are issued at par. Um, so in this case, it means right. Let me just write the formula well. We used to talk about the market values, KP, N years. Plus, now we are not, we are redeeming at par. Let me talk about the par value. We multiply by the present value this factor, KP, N years. Now, when you look on the preference dividends, right? The preference dividends of years, it means we are going to be taking 15%. It should be 15% of par, which is the annual. We multiply by the present value interest factor, annuity. We are discounted by 15%. If I'm not wrong, I don't think if we have any discounting factor there, we don't have. 15%, how many years? We have been told around 20 years, correct? 20 years. Plus, the par value of, of yours is how much? The par value is 100. Is it 100 years? The power value is 100. We multiply by the present value as factor 15% 20 years. So when you look at it, these are some of the basics uh, which you should be understanding well um, in finance. So in this case, the, uh, the preference dividend of ours is 15. We multiply by this annuity. The formula on Kumbuka Bizuri. 1 plus R, we raise for a negative N here. We divide by R. So in this case, it will be 1.15, uh, we raise for a negative 20, right? 1 minus answer, 
we divide it by 0 0.15, getting around 6.2593 plus 100 you multiply by what? 1.15 raised to a negative 20. We are getting 0 0.0611 now. How much is this? 15 times 6 points. Uh, 2593 plus 100 multiplied by 0 0.0611. We are getting 89 points 9995. That is what the, the first requirement when you are redeeming at par. Number two, we are being asked about we are redeeming at premium now. Here, when you are redeeming at a premium, it means. A premium is, a, is, is more above uh, the, the current price. So in this case, it means we are talking about 110%. 10 coming from the premium, which you are being told there, times 100, getting 110 shillings. So it means here, when we are redeeming at premium, we are taking our preferred dividends, which is 15. It doesn't change. The discount factor also is not changing. It is 6.2593. Right, plus now 110 times 0 0.0611. So how much is this? 15 times 6.2593 plus 110 times 0 0.0611, getting 100.61. Then number three, the examiner is talking about at a discount of 10%. A discount, it means you're giving a discount, so they are paying at 90% over 100, getting 90. So in this case, it means we are going to be taking our preferred dividends, which is 15, times 6.2593, right? Plus 90 now, times 0 0.0611. How much is this? 15 times 6.2593 plus 90. Right, uh, plus 0 0.0611. We are getting 183. It was a very small and simple uh, requirement there. There is part C. Question 3C. Someone is greeting me and is saying, how are you? Is, is the working of for value of preference share capital uh, of for value? Hmm? Yeah, let me go back. Huh? We're asking that. Uh... is not uh, asked about uh... remember we are looking on the let me look on your question here so that I can be able to explain on the working capital of frequency for value of preference share capital of the cost, the cost of preference share capital. Now, when you look at it, and I will just be able, there is a question which we did of uh, similar magnitude of uh, previous periods. I will be able to tell you that uh, um, um, we were able to talk about uh, when, for example, if the examiner was asking us, to compute uh, the cost of the, for example, when you talk about now the computation, because the cost, when, for example, uh, the cost of the discounting here is not provided, we normally use uh, the cost of the preference share capitals and you can be able there. The cost should be, the, the question should be to determine the value, by the way, it should be the value of the preference uh, when the, the shares are being issued at par, at premium, and at that discount, right? when they are issued at a discount, because 
if for example we are we are discussing about uh, the cost of the preference shares the cost of the preference share capital uh, the cost yeah when the market value they should that far when the market value is so so I, I have thought about something different. Let me just I will just be able to uh to repeat it and get back on that. I'll just be able to take on it in a different angle. And then when I do the solutions, yes, Juma, you can just unmute. Okay. Uh just my on to my my first question will be maybe just a correction. Mm -hmm. The 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 number three, where we are we have a discount of ten percent. Mm -hmm. The 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 cost or the value we've gotten is a bit high. C one eighty three. Is it not supposed to be the one eighty three here? The, the less, but not that. I'm getting ninety three, ninety nine point three something. Yeah. No, the, the down one discount, a 10% discount. We have par, premium, and then discount. Mm -hmm. When we do that calculation. I have said that. I have, I'm yes. looking the question in a different angle, whereby uh -huh. the, the cost of the preference shares might be asked as how. Uh, my friend there, Daniel, was asking. Uh, okay. I'm trying to make it in a different way, not as okay. the, the way we have done it. So just one minute. I look at it. So I will just be able to explain. Just one minute. Okay. And when calculate, you are asking about the the cost of the preference share capital but that is not the case we we can be able to roll back and check whether it is possible so allow me just to advise you uh, on that as we move forward somewhat reads question 3c question 3c An investor plans to borrow a loan of three million to purchase a piece of land for the family. The interest rate agreed upon is discounted at a rate of 10% per annum. The loan is repayable in four years in equal installments required. Amount payable per installment, a loan amortization schedule. So I know that uh, nobody who doesn't understand about the computation of the, the loan amortization schedule, and we say it's, this thing is basically applicable the way it is in an exam, right? So not in an exam, but uh, in the normal uh, working environment, uh, we can be able to look at it in that angle. So we can be able to see, we're going to be paying our loan after four years, right? With equal installments uh, uh, applicable there. So the first question an examiner is asking is about uh, is about the amount of pay payable per installment. So in this case, so if this is what you are handling now in an exam, you'd be able to tell me to get our amount of loan. To get our amount of loan, we are going to be taking our periodic installments. We multiply by the present value the factor annuity, R percent, and years. So in this case, because the examiner doesn't give you the periodic installment, we say to get our PI, we normally take the amount of loan. We divide it by the present value to factor annuity, R percent 
n years. So when you look on the the amount of uh, the amount of loan, as per the question, it means our amount of loan was three million. We divide it by the present value to factor annuity. What is our rate? When I look on that question, it means that our rate is 10%. Is it 10%? Yes. 10% per year. So you take 3 million here. You divide it with what? 3 million you divide with what? So you take 3 million, we say um, 1.10, I raise to a negative 4. 1 minus answer, we divide it by 0 0.1. We are getting 3.16. 1699. So, how much is your periodic installment? How much is your periodic installment? We say we take 3 million, we divide it by 3.1699, getting 946,946402. Correct. So, when you're calculating your loan amortization schedule, you take the number, the periods, or the years. We start with bank balance, beginning balance, right? We take our beginning balance. We talked about, uh, after the beginning balance, we normally talk about the installments. We take your installments. We have our interest. We have principal. Then we have the end balance. You have your end balance there. So your loan only takes four years. One, two, three, four. The beginning balance is three million. Right? The installment remains constant, 946, 942, 946, Four two nine forty six four two nine forty six four two. Then you start rolling back. So the interest will be at the rate of um, ten percent. The interest is at ten percent here. So ten percent will be how much? Ten percent of the beginning balance here will be three hundred thousand. Correct. What about the principal amount? The principal amount, you're going to be getting it by knowing very well that uh, we have to be taking the installment minus the interest. The installment normally comprise the interest and the principal amount. So in this case, if you subtract 300 out of 946, you're going to be having 646 for two. Then what is the end balance? The end balance, you normally take the beginning balance minus the principal amount. So 3 million minus 646, 402, we are getting 2353, 2353, 598, and that is what you normally open here too. So 2353, 2353, 598, you multiply by 10%, right? 10%, it means you're going to be having what? 235, 235. Uh, 2.35, 359.8. Uh, and in this case, when you're getting your principal amount, I take 946.42 minus 2.35, 359.80, getting 7.11, 7.11, 042.2. Then, uh, when you look on the end balance, we take 235, 3, 5, 9, 8, minus my answer, getting 1642, 1642, 5, 0.8. And when you look on the trend here, you'll be able to see the interest is uh, normally decreases as the principal amount increases. So when it, you go to year three, 1642, 5.8, right, times 0 0.1, getting 164, 
255, 0 0.58, 946, 402 minus my answer, getting 782, 782, 146.42, right? What is the head balance? 1642, right? 345.8 minus my answer, getting 860. 860 for 9 0 .38. 860 is opening year 4. 864 9 0.38. We multiply by 0 0.1. Getting it is 6000. 040.94. 946.42 minus my answer. Getting 860. 361, right? And I said in our previous class, when you see the difference, the difference is very small, and it's normally brought by the aspect of the rounding of errors. So here we are supposed to be getting nil. There you should be getting nil. At the end of the year four, you should have already finished, um, finished up uh, calculating the uh, uh, paying back your loan, paying back your loan. I think we don't have much problem with the with the loan amortization sh schedule. Now we have question number D, question three D now. Question number three D discusses about the use of effective interest rates method uh, to divide the Q of the preferred investment option. It is, the, when we talk about uh, the interest rates the interest rate method. Basically, it is a compounding method, uh, which basically uh, is going to be advising the investor whether uh, they can be able to, to get anything out of the investments. Now, in this case, we are being told there that uh, the Gen K has the following, uh, we are being told it has the following investment option to choose. So we have the post office. Uh, the post office and my hair scheme monthly interest of eight uh, percent per annum. We have ICD where we are being told that uh, um, the ICD is eight point two five percent. Then the the which is the quarterly interest. Um, I was forgetting the periods. The first one is monthly interest. The second one is quarterly interest. Then the last one is half yearly interest. So in this case, when you're looking on the formula for the computation of uh, interest, effective interest rates, and this question now is coming in your exam, this is what you're supposed to do. When you look on the question three here, you're supposed to be telling me that when you're calculating the effective interest rates, the formula to compute it should be one, plus rate over n. We raise this to power n minus 1. So let us start with the options available here. Option number 1 is when we are investing on the, uh, that uh, we are being told where we are investing in the post office, MIS scheme. The rate is 8%. So in this case, it means when I'm using the EIR now, I'm going to be taking 1 plus our rate now in this case, is 8%, right? 0 0.08, divide by the period. Our N now is the period. And when I look at it, sorry for that. Uh, when I look on the period as per the questions we have been told, it is monthly interest, right? It is monthly interest. So when you look on the monthly, we are going to be doing our analysis per year. Uh, because the, the investment will be taking the whole year. So our N in this case will be 12. We raise for 12 minus 1. Then option 2 here, you're going to be asking yourself, in a year, how many quarters do we have now? The quarters I think we should be having around 4. So it will be 1 plus the rate provided there, which is 0 0.0825. We divide it by the four quarters in a year. We raise power four minus one. Then the other one we are talking about half a year. 
So tukigawanya miaka mara mbili. Miaka tukigawanya it will be having a uh, two. So it means our n will be so we take our rate there which is 0 0.0850 you divide it by 2 raise it to power 2 minus 1 i think these ones are not confusing you monthly year we have analyzed in a, in a year we have 12 months right in a year because here we are analyzing on a quarterly basis we have four quarters in a year then when you subdivide your year into two parts then you are going to be counting year 1 uh, and year 2 so let me start by computing the first one 0 0.08 uh we we divide by 12 plus one right we raised for 12 minus one we are getting 8.3 percent right we're getting 8.3 percent the other one would be the other one would be last one now is it the last one yeah. the second one will be eight point uh, zero point zero eight two five you divide by four well one uh, plus one uh, we raise for four minus one we are getting eight point five percent then the the this one will be zero point zero eight five zero Divide it by 2 plus 1. We raise it to power 2 minus 1, getting 8.7%. Usha fanya hivi and you understand the, the formula now. You can be able to ask yourself, which option do uh, Jenny invest in? Uh, which uh, option can she invest in? So in this case, we can be able to say the preferred investment why should I write it? Let me just write it here. You can say the preferred investment option, the preferred investment option, the investment option, the preferred investment option, the preferred investment option, the preferred investment option is, um, um, in, uh, is HDC. HDFC Limited, right? How much does it offer as far our analysis? We go to the question. It has 8.7%. 8, 8, 8 uh, uh, HDFC Limited, right? With up year interest, with half year interest with half year interest since it has since it has the highest effective rates the highest the highest effective rates the highest effective rates of 8.7% since it has the highest effective rate of 8.7%, of 8.7%. Any question? Any question at that point? So I have seen we are remaining with only three, we are remaining with only three, um three questions there to complete the first um revision class of ours um uh, that why the, that one touches about the wcc we have uh, the optimal cash balances and then we have economic value added so those questions we can be able to do them uh, next time now i think over the weekend weekend on saturday we might not be there Sunday. Ni kumbusheni because now ni mukinyamaza. When you keep quiet, ni nyimu na umia. Kumbusheni tu. Malimu, can we have a class? Najua you are so much uh, in need of it. Don't keep quiet, please.